Hello there, IELTS students. Welcome to IELTS Podcast. You no longer have to worry, fret, or panic about IELTS because we are here to guide you through this test jungle. Enjoy these IELTS tutorials, and if you need more help or want to access the famous online course, you can visit us at IELTSpodcast.com. Hello IELTS students and welcome to this podcast today. We are going to be looking at IELTS results. So in this tutorial we're going to talk about how long it takes to get your results after you've done your test, how the results are delivered, how your final score is determined, that means how it's worked out, and how the results are sent to institutions, so that's if you are taking IELTS for university, how will they get the results, and also, if things don't turn out the way you want them to, how to request a review of those test results. So those are the things we're going to be talking about today. Firstly, I just want to take a moment to check in with you all, make sure you are all okay. Studying hard for the exam. I know so many uh, test centres have postponed the exams, so many of you are in that frustrating position of waiting, waiting to take an exam. And it's really hard to keep yourself motivated, keep yourself going. Um, you can practice so much writing essays, um, but you need a target to aim for. What we're hearing from our students is that some test centres are open. Definitely there's some open in London, if any of you are in London. Uh, there's other test centres opening up around the world, which is great. So fingers crossed that that carries on in the right direction. So before you worry about your results, obviously you need to understand how the IELTS test works. You need to understand what the exam is all about and what's expected of you. And I think that's a really, really important thing to emphasize. What is expected of you? So how do you score a band seven? What does this mean? What are you being tested on? What is the reading paper all about? What's the listening all about? What do you have to do in speaking? And obviously the big one, writing, that people find so complicated, not surprisingly. What do you have to do? What are the kind of tests you're asked about? What are the essay topics? And so on. And all the feedback uh, we have from our students and all the conversations that Ben has with successful students after they've passed comes back to this whole thing about understanding the exam, about really knowing what you have to do. And if you know what the test is about and what you're expected to do, then that's the first step in the right direction. Um, he was talking to Aline the other day. She's from Brazil, works in London, and she's just succeeded in her IELTS and done brilliantly. But she'd taken it before and she said one of the big problems was that she didn't really know what to expect. So by stepping back and researching and finding out what to do, that really, really helped her kind of tackle the areas where she felt less strong and obviously not worry about the areas where she was she was stronger. So she said that on reading and listening, she was quite happy with those because she'd lived in London for a while. But she knew that she'd done English at school, but the writing topics were completely different. This was a different style of writing. So she put in the time with essay correction packs to work on her formal English and academic writing, which is what we need for the writing. So once you know how the test works, you've done your preparation, you've finally taken the exam. Let's have a look at two things. So your results depend on when and how you took the test. So let's look at when to start with. So that's going to depend on which test you took and also if it was paper based or computer delivered. Now, since uh, 2000. 16, I think it was, I also introduced a computer-based test, which I think has been really successful, and many of you are probably preparing for it. Many of you have decided that that's the way you would rather go. Now, it's a different skill, obviously writing on a computer, to writing uh, an essay on paper. But I think the way we work nowadays, we're all pretty good at typing. Uh, we're more used to typing, maybe, than we are to writing an essay. 
And I think one of the major benefits of typing is that if you have made a mistake in your paragraph, <clears throat> excuse me, or if you look at your paragraph and you think, mm, I've gone a bit off topic, that example isn't perfect, I need to amend that quickly, you can go back and you can change it very, very simply. Whereas if you're doing that on paper, it's going to look messy, it might be more stressful for you, it might make it harder for the examiner to read. So we definitely would recommend the computer-based test if you are happier writing on paper, uh, writing on computer, sorry, writing on a keyboard. Um, and it just gives you a bit more flexibility. So if you've done the computer test, then your results are usually five to seven calendar days after that test date. So pretty quick. So let's say a week after you've done your computer test, you can look forward to your results. If you've done it on paper, uh, and this includes the IELTS UK VI, which is the visa immigration, it's 13 calendar days after the test date, not officially around about midday, lunchtime. Uh, so you can see longer for the paper, that probably takes the examiner longer to read the papers, then they have to be read by another examiner, it's part of the mo moderation process, uh, whereas the computer is obviously quicker. So if you're in a hurry, that might be another factor to encourage you towards taking the computer base. So the computer is five to seven days afterwards, and the paper based is 13 days, so two weeks roughly. So that's if you're taking the traditional IELTS uh, in an exam center, that's the paper or the computer. Um, but I want to just quickly mention to you now the IELTS indicator test. Now the indicator test, you may have heard pod us mention this in the podcast before. Ben and I did a special episode about this during lockdown because this is when the IELTS indicator test came into being. We also had another lovely student, Maria, and she IELTS indicator test. In fact, she alerted us to it, said, hey, I've, I've done this. This is amazing. And the IELTS indicator is was introduced really because of COVID, introduced to meet the need of students, really only academic students going for university. Okay, It's unfortunately not available for immigration purposes, but it is available for university study or postgrad study. So if you're planning on starting a course here in the UK or Canada or Australia, starting in October, uh, you can do the IELTS indicator and the results are accepted by your institution. I mean, check first, but basically this has been a really, really good collaboration between IELTS and the academic institutions themselves. So the indicator test you can do at home. This is a totally new thing. You can do it at home on your computer. Obviously, your computer has exam software on it, so you can't, it's like, doesn't make it easier. You can't be using a dictionary and you haven't got time anyway. But so you do this on your computer at home. You do the reading, the listening, the writing, just as you would in the exam center, but you're safe and you're in control. Uh, and then the speaking test is done with a real examiner, obviously, uh, via Zoom, so video um, conferencing. And that is usually a day before or a couple of days after, similar to what it might be in the actual IELTS. So that's the IELTS indicator test. Check that out on our podcast or check out the IELTS.com indicator test website. That will give you more information if you think that might help you. The good thing, again, about the IELTS indicator is that like the computer-based test, the results are available a week afterwards. So it's pretty quick. Uh, it just can give you, you know, an idea of where you are. It's accepted by the institutions. It's also a lot cheaper than the other IELTS exam in an exam center. So that might be, uh, and also another sort of bonus for you. So let's look at how the results are delivered. So the results are available to be viewed online, and they remain online for 28 days after the results come out. So 28 days after the results come out. And what you have to do is just check in with the British Council or IDP IELTS web page, and that will help you find your results. So officially, you then get your certificate. 
So you've got your results, you're celebrating, fantastic. Then you get your certificate, and this is called a TRF, which is the IELTS Test Report Form, TRF. And this can be collected in person or sent by post to your address. So it's a certificate much like an exam certificate you might have had previously, any exams you've taken at school, and it's presented then to the organization as proof that you have this valuable exam and you have been successful. So it's a really important piece of paper. Uh, it is printed on security enhanced paper, obviously so it can't be copied or fraud, any fraud committed. Uh, there's a photo of you. There's the uh, center stamp of where you took it, and that makes it valid, obviously. It's an official IELTS document with you, successful, that's it, I've got it. Okay, so that's a really satisfying moment when you've achieved that, and it's lovely when you have taken the time to send us your photos of you with your certificates. Thank you, that is the best thing. The great, smiling, happy, satisfied face. Uh, with this lovely certificate that is just going to take you through to the next stage of your journey. So your TRF, you can collect that from the test centre if you live nearby in the same city. If you're a long way away, not a problem, can be sent to you by post. If you collect it in person, you need to take your registered IELTS proof of identity. So if you registered for the exam with your passport document, then take that with you. Don't take your driving license, it won't work. Or if you registered with uh, like a, a document, a nationality document of some kind, uh, then take that with you. So make sure it's, it's a kind of silly mistake to make, but make sure you take the right documentation with you and then you can collect this certificate. Uh, some students, depending on the test centre, may receive an SMS on the day that the results come in. Um, so the, that will so that will just advise you, you know, okay, quick, you can go and have a look at them now. Um, but that's not that really depends on the test centre, so I wouldn't bank on that. Um, but that does happen sometimes. Um, it's important to say that results are not given over the phone. Um, so don't ring up and say, hey, can I have my results? because that uh, won't be possible. They've got a lot of students taking this, and it is a system, as you know. So let's have a little look at the band scores. So most of you who are taking the test, um, especially the students who I'm working with, I'll always say to you, what are you after? What do you need? What have you had before, when you've scored before? And that gives me a picture and our other essay characters a picture of where you are, of what you've achieved before. So if you've had 6.5 and you've done the exam three times in a row, then okay, we're really, really pushing for the band seven. But the advantage is that you know the test. You know pretty much what you have to do. So we're working on what you know, what your strengths are, and then we're just working on those weaknesses and seeing how we can iron out or get rid of those weaknesses or transform the weaknesses into strengths. So identifying the areas where we need to put in extra work. So the test report form, this TRF, gives you your overall band scores on a scale of zero to nine and provides a breakdown of your scores in each test area. So that is your listening, your reading, writing and speaking. And your final band score is simply the average of those four scores of each individual section of the exam. So let me give you some examples. And just I've got the um, IELTS definitions here for me, in front of me. So band seven is described as a good user. Your English level is described as a good user. This means, according to them, you have a good command of English, but also you have occasional inaccuracies occasional, that's not really very many, misunderstandings or inappropriate words. Sometimes that's just a mistranslation from your language. So occasional inaccuracies, misunderstandings or inappropriate words. But at a band seven, you can use complex language quite well and understand detailed argumentation quite well. Uh, okay, so for me, I mean, I think the writing, actually, this description doesn't give justice to the band seven. I think band seven is excellent. 
Um, I think you can use complex language well, um, but this is their definition. The most important key points just to draw from that are only occasional errors and it uses complex language quite well in most situations. That does mean that you're writing. I mean, I'm thinking mostly on writing here, but of course it connects to speaking as well. Your writing is pretty sophisticated. You have got a wide range of vocabulary. You're happy to uh, use quite complex grammar structures, conditional sentences, relative clauses to show those to the examiner. A band eight, let's have a little look at that, is described as a very good user. And notice the difference here. Rather than having good command of English, has complete command with only rare errors which are unsystematic. This might be almost called a slip rather than an error. You've just typed something wrong. It's just you've missed off the plural S, but this is not a mistake that's coming again and again and again. It's just like one off mistake or an inappropriate word. It says you can band aid deal with complex situations well, but has rare, so again, not often, errors in complex situations, but can deal with detailed argumentation. So in a band seven, you understand argumentation quite well, but a band eight, you can deal with it. Okay, so there's a difference there. You can see you step up from the band eight to the band eight from the band seven. Key points there, I think, are rare errors. I mean, really, that's not much, not many at all, and uses complex language well. So those are your obviously the gold standard ones we're looking at, the eight and the seven. I'm not going to worry about nine. Um, and six, interestingly, so six comes out as a competent user. Effective command of English, but also some errors, inappropriate words and misunderstandings in some situations. Okay, um, so we're thinking of this seven, which is what we want. So the final score, you're given uh, a grade for each section, as we said. And it's the average of the four. So if you scored listening seven, reading eight, writing seven, speaking eight, you add that up to 30 divided by four, your band score is 7.5. Okay, fantastic. Very happy with that. You've got your writing seven, speaking and reading in eight excellent results. If you have listening 6.5, reading seven, writing 5.5, so quite a lot weaker, maybe you had a bad day, speaking 6, the final band score is going to be 6.5. So again, the total divided by 4, uh, which gives you 6.25, and then you'll round it up to 6.5 there. Uh, again, combinations, listening 7, reading 7, writing 6, a bit weaker, and speaking 7, your final score would be 7, because you've got your 27 total divided by 4 is 6.75, rounded up to 7. Uh, now, it feels like a maths lesson here, and I'm going to stop on the adding up. Um, but if you want more details, go to the Take Arts British Council uh, Test Scores Explained website. I'll give you a link to that. And that just talks you through the different possibilities so that you can understand. But what I want to just stress here is that most students come to us because they're finding the writing difficult and it's really important when you think about those test scores there those examples that i've given that a weakness in writing can really drag you down it can drag you down a lot um from your 6.5 uh from your seven you want to your 6.5 and this is why so many people get stuck on this very annoying and very frustrating 6.5 because you're the writing is just weaker than the rest of everything else. So focus, if you that's you, if you know that your writing is weaker than it should be, or you feel you need a bit of help with your writing, then get in touch. Send us a mock, uh, send us a sample essay. Uh, you can find the links to this on our website. Send us an essay and we will give you feedback and that will help you improve. We can say to you, hey, this is going great, well done, or, but actually you really need to focus on this to be looking at your band seven. And so we work with so many students doing this on the online course, uh, Ben's 12 sentence guide to writing, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, that just works really well for people. And I think gives them the confidence as well to move forward.
And I just want to bring in an example here of Rebecca, who I worked with for a long time. She's now a Canadian teacher. So happy. She's been in Canada for a while, needed to take her IELTS in order to qualify to be a primary school teacher. And that was her dream. And she came to us with good scores, but her writing was only six. And she'd taken her IELTS two or three times and was incredibly frustrated and really needed a seven in writing to be accepted for her teaching course. Uh, and so we worked together, uh, lots of feedback. She bought the um, course and then did two extra correction packs. So she was really confident. She knew exactly what to do, what the examiner was wanting, and she knew that she could do it. And that was a great story. And I think, you know, if you have got a dream to be a teacher or if you're a medic and you know that you need to get this IELTS 7 or 8 even, to qualify in a different country and to be registered, it's absolutely worth it. There's so much motivation. Uh, you can, you know, we can try and keep you going, but stay motivated towards that dream you've got. Um, another student we had was Sachin in India, and he just said, I really need help on my writing. He was scoring eights in other parts of the exam, but a 6.5 in writing, and he needed to get that up to a seven. Um, and so he really appreciated the feedback. So he said, you know, you've given me really comprehensive feedback on errors that I think he didn't realize he was making. So that was really good to be able to um, help people like that and achieve those great scores. So what I want to say there is make sure that you are not very weak in one section. If you feel you've got you, you've done it before, you're looking at your results and you're going, do you know what? My writing is really letting me down Then address that. Take a move, be positive, do something about it, and get some feedback on that writing and make sure the writing doesn't let you down again. So the indicator test results are calculated in the same way. The indicator test we talked about earlier, and it's exactly that. It provides an indication of your probable score that you would take if you took the test in a centre. It's more than a mock exam because it is valid. So it's accepted by these universities, as we said. But it is, just to remind you, only available for academic and it's only available for universities. It is not, unfortunately, for immigration. Uh, so check always with the institution you want to go to that they are having, they're happy with that. Um, but you can always contact them or contact your agent. Just be aware of that test because it is a possible uh, avenue for you to go down. And then the scoring is exactly the same. So what is a good score? <laughs> kind of million dollar question, isn't it? It really depends why you're taking your exam. So if you are going to university in the UK, for example, I know at the moment the test scores are generally around 6.5, but 6.5 overall, but some people are accepting less because at the moment they really want to fill the places. So because of COVID, there's been a lot of uncertainty about university entrance for September. Some universities are saying, yes, we will do face-to-face -face, uh, work. Others are saying, do you know what? It's going to be mostly online, but you can start. You're still going to get this education. You can still move forward in your career planning, which is what you want to do. So overall, some institutions are 6.5, but they're reducing that a little bit. So that might give you an opportunity to come in this year. Again, get your uh, agent to have a look at that for you. So generally, uh, and also for IELTS general, so we're thinking of what's a good score, a band score of six might be okay for visa, uh, but for postgraduate study, so undergraduate, you'd probably be okay with six, 6.5. Postgrad, you'd probably need a seven because that's gonna be a lot more complex, a lot more sophisticated, and also, you don't want to be struggling on the language side when you've got so much incredible stuff to learn and amazing teaching to, um, uh, to engage with. So check your details or check what's needed with the appropriate authority because there are variations um, and that might give you some flexibility. So Ben was talking to a lovely student of ours, Vinod, the other day, and he had realised that in Canada, they were accepting people with slightly lower scores uh, because they had a quota to fill. So they were allowed to take X amount, X number of people, and they were below that number. So they said, okay, 
to order to get us to the right number. We'll just reduce the scores a tiny bit, just for a very short time. But he managed to capitalize on that and make the most of it, which was brilliant. So he was really doing his research. He was really looking at exactly what was needed when, kept on registering with that, kept on thinking about that. And that was very successful. So there may be flexibility is what we're trying to say. So to get a work visa for Australia, an average score of anything between five and seven might be required, depending on what kind of work you want to do and how long you want to stay. So you need to check this out before you take the exam, all part of your initial preparation. What do you need? Okay. What do you need? Then get familiar with the exam. And then when your results come through, you know whether you've got it. Also know what you're aiming for. That's so important. And so for more detailed information on the IELTS requirements and the visa process, you can find out more online. And as we say, talk to your agents, because this is something that is changing. With COVID, this is changing a lot uh, and almost weekly. So keep checking up on that. Really, really important. So what happens when you have got your TRF? When you've done your exam, you've got your results. So here's the possibility. If you have applied to universities already and you're just communicating your results, so if you've already got a conditional offer, so the conditional offer would be, yes, amazing, please come to us, but you need band 6.5, so it's a conditional offer, and you get your 6.5, you can do a few things here. When you register for IELTS, so when you register at the beginning, you can ask that an original TRF, so not a photocopy, an original TRF is sent to the institution or institutions that you've applied to. So you can say, where am I going? You can say, I'm going to the UK and I've got a list of five unis and they will send a TRF to that place, which is a really good idea. That means five can be sent out for free. You don't need to worry about it. And you don't then have the stress of trying to post something to the university, maybe getting the address wrong. You don't know who to send it to. So that can go direct um, and you can register five institutions completely free of charge. If you want to change that or register for a different place or another one, you would need to then pay. But that five is pretty good. Nice choice. If you have take, got your results and then you want to apply for uni. So if you're doing it results first, application second. You can request still that your TRF, your results, are sent to the institution or institutions you're applying to. And again, you have five that you can send out for free. But you must do this within a month of the test date. So pretty quick, month of the test date, not month of the results, month of the test date. So you need to get on with that pretty quickly. But probably you would know which uni you wanted to apply to. You've probably done your homework first. So again, check with the institutions. Some institutions may not need a piece of paper. They might be able to just access this online. That will save you the paper, or save everybody the paper and the postage and the extra anxiety. So all well and good, but what happens if on the day of your results, they're not what you wanted? Something went wrong, or you know that when you took your test, actually you ran out of time, uh, this does happen. This is a real awful thing in the writing. Sometimes people are so excited about their writing, they run out of time or they haven't had time to check and there's just too many errors in that. What if you haven't got the result you wanted? What you really think some, you should have? Yeah? I mean, obviously we know if everything's gone wrong, that's difficult, difficult to know what to do. But if you think you had a good day and the examiner, you're not getting what you wanted, then you may have every reason to question this. Okay? So what can you do if you want all or any part of your test result reviewed? Get back onto the centre where you took your test. Apply for an inquiry on results, inquiry on results at that centre where you took the test and you will fill in an inquiry on results form. Now there is a time limit on this you have to do this within six weeks of the test date, within six weeks of the test date. So around a month after the results is your deadline. So you get your results, you do your test, you wait for two weeks, you get the results. And then the deadline is a month after that 
if you wait till more time after that, you can't get this checked. So do it quickly, but you probably will do it quickly anyway. Uh, and you can ask for any of the exam sections to be reviewed. So if you don't like your writing, if you're not happy with it, and you think you should have got your 7 and you got 6.5 again, you can say, hey, you fill in the form, it's worth a try. Uh, there is a charge for this, so you need to be pretty sure that you really should have got that band 7. So it's obviously they're not going to do it for free, otherwise everybody's going to be saying, hey, I don't like my results, can you do it again? And the results, it must be said, they are double marked anyway. So you can send this in. You have to pay for each section that you want to be reviewed. And the, the fee for this will be refunded if your score increases. And that's pretty fair. So if they go, actually, do you know what? We had a look at it again. You've got the band seven. They'll give the money back to you. So that's good. Uh, if there's no increase, then there's no refund. And the results of the review will be available from between 2 and 21 days after the request is made. Now, in our experience, it is longer rather than quicker. Okay, so it could be up to three weeks. So if you're going to question something, question it quickly would be my recommendation because obviously you need your results. It's important. You need to know where you are. So it could be that you put in your uh, inquiry on results form and then you have to wait another three weeks for that uh, verification or that modification to be made. But it is possible, it is a process, and we do have students who have questioned their writing and have, done, have come and the result has come back and they've got what they want. So honestly, we would always say, if you think there's a chance, do it. It's a, it is a process, make the most of it. Uh, and is it worth it? Well, yes, it is. Um, I'm thinking of Elena, who I worked with from Russia, and she had done her writing before. She took the course with us. She bought extra correction packs. We worked really, really hard together, getting her writing longer because her essays were quite short and getting her really more confident on the grammar. She was making quite a few grammar mistakes. So we worked on the grammar. We built in conditional sentences. We just kind of put some more complex grammar in there for the examiner to recognize. And she got a 6.5 again. And we went back and looked at her essays and thought, hang on a minute, that list just, she's doing, she should be doing better than that. And she felt she should be doing better. And so she questioned it. And she went back and said, OK, I want a question on my uh, writing section, please. And she came back with her seven. So that was a really happy story um, because we all felt that she could get that. And she certainly felt that on the test, day it had been okay so it was really really worth that questioning so is it worth it yes it is worth it as long as you know that that's pretty much what you should have got so <clears throat> the listening and the reading tests are marked according to an answer sheet so there's no point in requesting a remark in that obviously it really is only relevant to the writing and the speaking so what happens so in the, your paper or your um, audio from your speaking will be remarked by different examiners. So twice, marked by one, and then marked by another, but different from the ones you had first time. And their results will be checked against the original set. So the four examiners in the end will have read your paper, and then their opinion will be all discussed. So the length of time, obviously, to complete this depends on how many exam sections are to be checked. If you're only getting your writing checked, that will be quicker than if you're getting everything checked. So writing and speaking, you can see that might be a bit longer. You are never given an explanation. Just so you know, don't expect them to say, oh, really, sorry, um, actually, you're amazing. You won't get any comments at all. You will just get, OK, now you're a seven or sorry. It's still 6.5. So don't expect any nice um, postcard from the examiner uh, saying congratulations. They're just not into that, sadly. Uh, so, OK, today we have been looking at IELTS results. So how long it takes to get them, uh, how you get them, how the score is determined, what a band user, what it means, your band 7 and your band 8, the descriptions of those we looked at. Uh, how the results are sent to the institutions, and if it all goes wrong and you don't get what you want, is there something you can do in getting a review? And yes, there is. 
So I've mentioned today our online course, and I've mentioned students who've taken the course, who've invested in the feedback, who we've worked with to keep them motivated, to build their confidence. So if you feel that you need a bit of help on your IELTS preparation, if you feel that you could do with someone looking at your essays and guiding you as to how to achieve it, then let us know, get in touch. Um, IELTSpodcast.com, you can find loads on the website. We're really, really happy to help you. Uh, let us know and uh, send us an email and we will do our very best to help you out in your IELTS preparation. Thank you for listening. I'm Daphne and take care. Thanks for listening to IELTSpodcast.com.